Well, we're in Genesis uh, 34, chapter many of you have just been really looking forward to. Rape and genocide, very uplifting message for you here this morning. And uh, as we've said be- before, there, there are challenges teaching through the word. Uh, I understand why uh, the temptation to just teach topically, you could just pick whatever you wanted. That kind of sounds pretty easy, actually. Just what you like. <laughs> But that, of course, therein lies the problem. That's, that's, that's what I would teach on. All the stuff I like all the time. Stuff you would like to hear. But uh, uh, if we try to give you the whole counsel of God's word, we're, we're going to go through uh, the good, the bad, uh, and the ugly. And, uh, and again, we're reminded by chapters like this that God's word is inspired. Otherwise, if man writes this, this chapter is not in here. I, I can just tell you that. This chapter is not in here. And you don't find chapters like this in ancient literature that are extolling a culture, a kingdom like the Assyrians, the Egyptians. Like according to the Egyptian writing, they never lost a war. They tied a couple of times, but they never actually lost a battle. Uh, uh, but... Um, God's word is uh, inspired. He gives it uh, all to us, uh, including uh, this horrific scene uh, that takes place in a, in a town or a village uh, called Shechem. So the message is the sin at Shechem. Well, let's uh, pray before we get into things here. Father, we ask you to <clears throat> once again just give us hearts to hear and easy to look at this as uh, just a, uh, a sordid time in the history of your, of your people and the sons of Jacob and see no meaning or uh, in any way related to our own lives, Lord. But um, as Jeremiah reminds us, our, our hearts are deceitfully wicked, and who can know them? And uh, Lord, it, uh, I hope when we see the sin of others, even these kinds of things, like the Apostle Paul, we'd be able to say, there go I, but by the grace of God, that you've uh, intervened and reached out to us with your love, your mercy, and as we're learning your incredible grace, the depths of which you've already expressed to us, we really can't even totally comprehend because your ways are higher than our ways. They're beyond our understanding. And that passage in Isaiah, again, about your goodness, your grace. But I pray that we would grow in our understanding of that very subject this morning. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jacob, again, is uh, we've been tracing him and uh, in his uh, his life, and we've seen the ups and the downs as we saw with Abraham and Isaac, and that's going to continue here for a while until we get to to Joseph, and uh, uh, and then uh, it's not the bad things jo- Joseph does; it's the bad things that happen to him, and of course how he reacts to those circumstances. All of this and what happens here is going to play a part in the rest of, of Genesis. Uh, Jacob, at times, his faith soars as we saw his decision to go back to the land God promised him, leave uh, Laban, even though Laban may hunt him down and kill him. He decides to trust the Lord, to obey the Lord, and he does that. And you remember God's intervention as Laban does catch him, uh, and God gives Jacob the peace uh, to be able to call that place Mizpah, a watchtower. Basically, God saying to Jacob, I got your back. You don't have to worry about Laban anymore. He's able to move on from that and proceed with this idea of reconciling with his brother, whom 20 years prior swore an oath to kill him. That took a lot of courage. That took a lot of faith as well. Uh, And, of course, during that time, he's still planning. He's still thinking. He's still figuring out a way to make it happen. And he divides and sends groups of animals as this tremendous gift, a gift we said fit for a pharaoh at that time, Uh, And uh, Esau can't figure out what's going on. But uh, Jacob has in that night a wrestling match. It turns out later is with God. And in the end, he surrenders. And that's how he wins. He's blessed by God. He's crippled as a reminder. But his name is changed uh, to, uh, to Israel. Somebody that wrestled with God and surrendered to him. In there lies his new strength. That's good. He's able to proceed, and he sees that God answered his prayer. Esau's heart's changed. He runs to him. He embraces him. He kisses him and so forth. And all that was good, and all that was glorious. Then Esau invites him to come with him and his men to his place, again, the rock city of Petra down in southern Jordan, not where he was headed. Where was uh, Jacob supposed to go? To Bethel, back to the place where he made a vow to God. 
So, of course, he says to Esau, you know, brother, I would like to go with you, but I've made a commitment to the Lord. I'm going to follow the Lord. I made a vow to him and nothing can dissuade me. Thank you for your offer, but I'm walking with the Lord and this is what we're doing. Not that's not exactly what he said. Actually, what he said is he lies to Jacob. <laughs> he lies to Esau and says, hey, you go right ahead. We're just kind of like right behind you. Should I leave some men with you? No, 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 no. That's not necessary. Well, we'll kind of catch up with you. And of course, as soon as his brother's out of sight, he turns and goes the other way. And goes back the direction north that he came from, still not going to es Esau. Uh, excuse me, to Israel. His sons are watching. His sons are, are learning. And we're going to see that they understand the concept of lying and deceiving uh, as it comes to play in this story. He goes to Sukkoth, where he builds a house, still in present-day Jordan today. Finally, at some time, we don't know how long, he finally crosses the Jordan, goes into Israel, but does not go to Bethel, heads further up, and we showed you on a topographical map, uh, into a more mountainous area of Shechem. Uh, we believe he's thinking he's still hiding, running from. Is he concerned about Laban or Esau? But fear is directing him and not faith in the Lord. And now he's at a place where some terrible things are going to happen uh, as a result. His family is going to experience some horrible things. They're going to do some horrible things. And it's all because Jacob is not walking in faith. Well, let's look at uh, what happens to his daughter. In English, we say uh, Dinah, but uh, again, Dina in, uh, in Hebrew. And we say that Dina is disgraced, verses 1 to 7. Now, Dina was the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, uh, went, uh, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hiphite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dina, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Give me this young woman as a wife. Jacob heard that he had defiled Dina, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved, very angry, because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. Three factors that lead to uh, this uh, uh, disgrace, and again, we're, we're using that, that term. It's one of the terms that's used, but uh, uh, what happens here is, uh, is so much worse than that, as we'll see. Uh, but three factors that lead up to it we've already alluded to. Uh, one, again, is the fact that she, well, she's not the only daughter. She's the one mentioned prior because she comes into play in this story. Later in chapter 46, we find that there are, are other daughters, but she's Leah's daughter. Leah, the unloved mother, uh, Leah, the, the sons and so forth, that when it was time to meet Esau and he might kill them, well, you guys go right out front there and, uh, uh, and uh, I'll send uh, the, wife, the one wife I love and the one son that I love, we're going to kind of be in the back here. These kids are not kids anymore, they're young men and they figured out long ago that dad doesn't really love them, care about them and, uh, and we're going to see that and, uh, and obviously that's the case with this uh, this young lady, very young lady, as we'll, we'll see uh, here in a moment. Uh, and that's a factor. Uh, Dina appears to have been of little interest at all to Jacob, her father. Secondly, Jacob was not where God wanted him to be, as we said, geographically and therefore spiritually. In this case, those two things were, were tied together. Uh, the third thing is that Dina was uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time herself. Uh, this was actually unheard of. Verse 1, she went out to see the daughters of the land. Young girls don't do this. Young girls don't just leave the tent, leave the encampment, go into this strange city. How strange was it? Well, it was the Canaanites. The Canaanites that we know from Scripture, that we know from history and from the archaeological findings that we have, were, that were one of the most morally perverted societies that has ever lived on the face of the planet. There might not be a close second. They were as bad as you, you can get. Those are the daughters of the land. It's not like she's going to the mall to hang out with the girls from high school. That's, that's not uh, what's happening here. Uh, again, 
went out to see the daughters of the land. We're reminded back in Genesis 24, verse 2, Abraham's instructions are remembered to his servant to go find a, uh, a, a wife for Isaac. So Abraham said to the oldest servant in his house who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth. What's so important? That you will not take a wife for my son from who? The daughters of the Canaanites, uh, the same gals just mentioned here, um, whom I have dwelt. Now remember that Esau at some point in time marries two of these gals. Uh, and what was the result? In chapter 26, verse 34, when Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives uh, Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and uh, Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, again, both Canaanites, uh, and they were a grief of mine to Isaac uh, and Rebekah. Uh, even if where she was going was not so treacherous, she's still way too young. And uh, uh, what's implied in the Hebrew text when it says she went out, uh, it implies the idea that she wasn't supposed to. Uh, so, uh, and as we'll see her age in a moment, uh, she's uh, again, wrong place at the wrong time. Had no idea what she was getting into, although, well, she should have, because after all, the whole point of God entering into the relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was to keep them, in a sense, isolated from the Canaanites, be a witness to them, certainly, but don't intermarry, don't uh, get yourselves involved, because bad things will happen, and there's some bad things here. Martin Luther, kind of a classic line, and I was reminded that uh, Danny quotes it uh, in his most recent book. Uh, Luther said, you can't stop birds from flying over your head, but you can stop them from nesting in your hair. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, they're up there flying, but if they start building a nest in your hair, you know, that's something you can prevent. Luther there talking about that there are temptations out there for believers. Uh, there's nothing we can do about the temptations that are out there. But we can stop from entertaining them and bringing them into our, our thought life and into our mind and, and so forth. And one of the things that uh, certainly we want to be very careful of is the influences uh, over our lives. I was uh, reading an interesting study about the idea of athletic teams having a home field advantage. It's talked about a lot. And, and if you're a sports fan, you you pretty much realize, you can kind of see, at least statistically, that teams do better when they're playing at home. It's a big thing to go on the road and win on the road. And there's been a lot of speculation over the years as to why. You know, whether it's in football, where the field is, where it's located, how loud the fans are, you know, and so forth. And you could see other, uh, other circumstances for different sports. A couple guys did a whole study of it. And uh, what they found was there, there definitely was a home field advantage, but not for the reasons that we think. We're often cited again, well, these guys are used to this kind of turf, and they're not, or they're used to, you know. It wasn't any of those things. It wasn't even how loud the crowd was in one stadium or another. It's because the officials favored the home team almost every time, statistically. Why did they do that? They're professionals. You know, you get millions of people watching them make these calls on national television. Why would they do that? And the conclusion was it was because of the fans in the stadium and their shouting, their cheering, their booing calls and so forth. It affected and influenced the way that they saw the calls and the way that they called the game. There truly is a home field advantage. But it goes to tell us that there are and can be influences over our lives and we need to be very careful. Even the professional referee in the NFL uh, or the NBA, wherever he might be, that uh, uh, swears that uh, he's unaffected by the fans around him, evidently is. And uh, we can't do anything about the birds flying in the sky, but we don't have to allow them to nest in our hair. And we need to be careful about uh, the company we choose, who we spend time with. We should be building relationships with unbelievers so that we can share the gospel with them. And that's the only reason. And uh, Nina had no business, again in this case, apparently disobeying her parents. And of course, going into a treacherous uh, area. Of course, she may not have seen it that way. And we may, may not either as we, as we uh, are out there in the world. 
But Jacob had, uh, again, endangered his family by living in Shechem. Uh, Dina had placed herself in danger by going into town alone. And uh, does she receive uh, part of the blame for this? No, not, not uh, in any way. But it is one of the circumstances around what takes place next. And uh, why she doesn't, well, that's part of what we're going to mention in a moment. But secondly, she's disgraced. And by disgraced, we say we mean she was raped. Uh, there's uh, some writers that even try to dodge this. Well, he wanted to marry her. And maybe that, listen, uh, uh, she, look at the three verbs in verse 2. He took, he lay, he violated. It's a progression of, uh, of brutality. Uh, Shechem is the prince of the city. He's probably a guy that uh, is used to getting his way and calling the shots and, uh, and doing anything that he wants. In terms of Dina, when it says that she's a young woman, in verse 3, the Hebrew word there is na'ara, but in verse 4, uh, it's a different word, yalda. And the whole point of that is it tells us, in a sense, her age. The first word that's used, she could be anywhere from, from just born all the way to adolescence. If that's all we had, then uh, she could be 13, 14, 15 years old, at the oldest. But the yalda word is only used for girls. Dina's probably eight or nine or 10 years old. She's 11 or 12 at the most. You understand a little bit when her brothers come in, her older brothers, her father seems to be indifferent about the whole thing, which is part of the problem. You understand when her older brothers come in, they're ready to kill somebody. Uh, it, you know, you can understand that a, l a little bit. Uh, even even uh, the people that have no, <laughs> not the same sense of values and morals to us, Pretty much everybody agrees that child pornography is wrong. I mean, that, that incenses uh, everybody uh, across the board. And, uh, and when we begin to understand the real picture here, well, it's, it's even worse than we thought. The third thing about the disgrace, it leads to a marriage request. And uh, two things that are shocking about this is, uh, well, it's just shocking that there's a request. I don't really have an explanation for it. Some people talk about him trying to do the honorable thing or even later under the law of Moses, if something like this happened, he would be obligated to marry, pay the dowry, and he could never, ever divorce uh, the, the woman. Uh, there, were, there were consequences uh, to the actions. Uh, verse 3 says, his soul was strongly attracted to uh, Dina, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman. Uh, and again, uh, that's what it says. Who knows what's going on, but keep in mind we're de dealing with somebody that's a Canaanite whose moral values are completely perverse uh, compared to ours or anything uh, close to it, uh, even today culturally. Uh, he says in, uh, later, uh, get me this young woman as a wife. Literally, we might translate that. I demand you get this little girl for me as my wife is kind of literally what's being, being said there. Uh, so that response is certainly shocking, but so is the response of Jacob, I've already alluded to, uh, in the fact that there, well, look at verse 5. Jacob heard that uh, he had defiled uh, Dina, his daughter. That's about it. Now his sons were uh, with the livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until he came. Is this a man of tremendous self-control? No, I think it's a guy that's completely indifferent. I'm sorry. This is your daughter. She's like nine years old, and this guy just raped her. You're not ready to kill her yourself. Uh, I mean, you might be sh have showing some restraint and not, not laying into the guy right there, maybe. But that's not the response of Jacob. Jacob's just like, wow, this is kind of a bad thing here. Uh, better tell her brothers. You know, it's, it's just, it, it's kind of shocking. Uh, but notice the brothers, when, uh, when they come in in verse 7, uh, it says that they were grieved and, uh, and very angry. The word anger uh, in Hebrew is karaf. And uh, that's why nobody sits in the front row in case I have to pronounce that uh, <laughs> C-H or K in Hebrew. You can't really do that without um, you know, saliva coming out of your mouth. If you can practice in front of a mirror, if you hit the mirror, you've, you've pronounced it correctly. But uh, visitors probably always wonder why nobody sits uh, right up close here. But uh, uh, what it means, it means, uh, interesting, it means to glow or grow warm. Have you ever been so mad that you, you can feel your forehead kind of just heating up you're about ready to come unglued and for very good reason that's that's what's going on with the, the brothers at this point now of, co of course what they do is horrible but being this angry is okay 
this is a normal response here. Uh, it's okay. This is called righteous indignation. We got, we got to do something with this guy about this situation. There's no way that this guy is getting away with it. That's fine. It's just the eye of, of, of vengeance is not a good way of handling. And how do they handle it? They go and punish that one guy? No, they kill every guy in the village. I think that's a little over the top. That's vengeance. That's vengeance in, in what it does. That's why God ordains and orchestrates government, Paul says, and all of us submit to that government. And that's why we've got men that raise their, and women that raise their right hand, put on a uniform, put on a badge, or, or wear a military uniform to oversee the uh, authority within our, our, our civilization, in our country, in our state, in our county here, so that we don't have to, well, there's a way of dealing with these things but God says, vengeance is mine and I will repay, but they're not going to wait for that. Uh, so secondly, we'll note that Shechem is determined to marry Dina, despite uh, what has transpired, verse 8. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife and make arrangements with us. Give us your daughter, give your daughters to us and take our daughters to yourselves. So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Uh, dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. So uh, Hamor is determined, we'd say, to gain permission and uh, by making an offer he thinks they can't refuse. Three aspects of the offering. He offers that uh, uh, we'll give our daughters to one another uh, in marriage and thereby becoming one people. Is that a little problem for Jacob? That's a problem, isn't it? Because they weren't supposed to do that. In fact, they're warned not to do that very thing. Here's why I don't want you intermingling because there'll be the temptation to marry their daughters to give your daughters to become one people, and you'll end up just like them. Did that become an issue with the uh, children of Israel in the land later? Yes, yes, it did. It was an ongoing uh, problem. And, uh, and, of course, Jacob jumped in and said, whoa, we can't be doing that. You know, we're, we're a called-out people. God's got his hand on us. He's given us a promise. He's given us a covenant. And, no, no actually, Jacob doesn't intervene at all at this point. Next, he offers to allow Jacob to prosper materially. Uh, in fact, uh, he says, this land here, I don't know if he jumped out saying this land is my land, this land is your land. But uh, uh, nonetheless, he, uh, uh, that's what he's saying. Uh, in a sense, if you think about it, he says uh, that uh, the promised land can be yours right now. God's promise, I promise to give this land to your descendants. Again, the writer of Hebrews says they journeyed in faith, trusting, believing that God would give it to their descendants. That's why it was such a big deal, remember, for Abraham to buy the tomb to be married so he could be buried there with his wife, uh, Sarah, because he was going to remain in the promised land. We'll see with, jo with Joseph, it's a big deal that in his deathbed, he says, whatever you do, when God gives you the land, take my bones back there and buried there. The patriarchs were sojourning, looking for a builder, a city and builder whose maker was God, but he was going to give the land to the descendants. And this guy, the enemy of God's people, says, you don't have to wait that long. You can have it all right now. That's, that's what the enemy does a lot of times. God's promises, you don't have to wait that long. You can have them right now. That's what Satan said to uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. The third of the three temptations was... The devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you'll fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall uh, you shall serve. Satan is saying, oh, you don't need to go to the cross. You want the kingdoms of the world? You don't have to suffer. You don't have to die. All you've got to do is bow down and worship me. We'll short circuit the whole thing. It's a very similar thing here. But we find in scripture in our own lives, the promises of the enemy don't exactly kind of measure up, do they? There's always the, this is the easier way. 
just compromise a little bit here. I, uh, uh, I love the story of David and Goliath, of course, and there's a, there's a lot of things that are at play there, but one of the things that is the whole premise that sometimes we don't think about is remember the promise was Goliath, the Philistine, the enemy of God's people, came out and said, I'm the champion representing the, Philipp uh, the, the Philippines, <laughs> the, the Philistines, excuse me. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. I'm not going to say another word. <laughs> and uh, and the, uh, the Israelites, of course, are to send out their champion as well. And, of course, after days of taunting, David goes out. But you remember the outcome. David goes out and, uh, you know, throws a sling, you know, hits Goliath in the forehead, Enough to uh, knock him unconscious for long enough for him to go up, grab his sword, and take his head off. And, of course, at that point, all the Philistines said, well, we surrender then. That was the deal. No, they didn't. They actually ran for it, didn't they? Uh, Satan always comes with promises that are actually, actually lies. And, uh, but wanting to convince us of something otherwise. And we see that with Shechem. Now, we're going to see a little speech from him at the sea gate to... Uh, to uh, help understand how deceitful his words uh, really were in just a moment. The third thing he offers to pay any dowry they suggest, you name it. And of course, by custom, by culture, it was a set amount, but he goes beyond that and says, I'll give you anything that you want as a dowry, you name it. I'm sure Hamor and Shechem thought this was a slam dunk. There's no way these guys are gonna pass it up. I mean, yeah, they got a lot of wealth, but there's not many of them. Anybody could override them, kill them. How do they think they're going to be safe in this land with so many warring tribes around? With us, they'll be safe. They'll be secure. They'll have the land. A dowry, they can name anything they want. Certainly, I'm, they're fully expecting Jacob to go along with this and his sons. Aha, uh -huh. they don't know who they're dealing with here, though. Uh, <laughs> the third part of this, the deception of Jacob's sons, it's for the purpose of revenge, verse uh, 13. But the sons of Jacob, not, notice not Jacob, but the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dina, their sister. And they said to him, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we'll consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will take your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. Did I mention they're holding Nina? I mean, we're going to find that part of what they do is a rescue mission. She's still at the guy's house. They've never, she's basically being held captive uh, at this point. Uh, but the deception is, again, a counter offer to the uh, marriage proposal. <laughs> they, they want all the men to be, uh, to be circumcised. Now, <clears throat> obviously, they, they've got something in mind here. And, of course, circumcision was the, the symbol or the sign of the covenant, the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, it is a, a very big deal. It is a, a religious ceremony, a religious rite. It was required. Remember, it's an issue even in the, uh, in the New Testament times. Uh, they didn't know what to do with Gentile believers uh, coming to faith in Christ. In Acts 15, they have to have a, a big meeting over whether they, uh, they need to be circumcised or not. Uh, and the, uh, for, fortunately, the outcome of that was, uh, was they didn't. And Paul just lays out a few principles for the the Gentile believers there. But uh, it was a big deal. Uh, again, the anger behind the demand, Jacob's sons are justified. They think, they think, uh, because of what has happened to their, their sister. Uh, they think their vengeance is justified. And of course, do they go in and kill Shechem for what he did? No, they, they kill everyone because that's what anger and vengeance does. It's always uh, over the top. That's why... Uh, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And of course, under the law of Moses was written in something that was already culturally accepted. And that is what we call in English an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And sometimes people think that's harsh. No, that's mercy. That, that's to keep this stuff from kind of happening. Uh, you let the punishment fit, uh, fit the crime. Uh, but that's not what's happening here. It's anger and, and uh, vengeance that's driving this. And then the deception. 
They, um, their offer apparently was plausible to the Shechemites, uh, a normal practice among them. Apparently they knew about it and so forth. Uh, and of course, part of Israel since uh, Genesis 17. But keep in mind, again, this was a, this was a, a rite, a ceremony, which really made you, uh, made you Jewish. And uh, it was considered a, a, a holy thing. It would be the equivalent, what's our sign of the covenant that we're under? Well, it's, we call it communion. It's the bread and the cup. That is the sign of the new covenant. It would be like you're angry at somebody, uh, you're mad at somebody, you want to get back at somebody, so you, th you tell them that uh, please come in and we're going to have communion. And you give them the cup and you give them the, the bread and you say we have to pray over it first. And while they have their head bowed and their eyes closed, you come up behind them and slit their throat. Uh, that's, that's the idea. I mean, it's, it's not just that it was deceptive. It's, it's, the, it's that they were using circumcision to, to actually for the deception. Uh, and of course, uh, there's a lot of cultures around the world that would read this and go, hey, that was pretty smart. Because their, their, their moral understanding, would this would be all justified. Uh, and in those cultures, it's where the gospel has never had a penetration, where people have not really come to understand and have a, a set of moral values and the same kind of worldview that we have. The things that uh, in this chapter that shock us, shock us because we have a, a Judeo-Christian worldview uh, in a sense of morality that, uh, that only comes through the understanding of God's word. Uh, the fourth thing about this whole thing is the discussion at the gate of the city had to be convincing, wouldn't you say? Verse 18, and their words pleased uh, Hamar and Shechem, Hamar's son. Uh, so the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's uh, daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. I'm not exactly sure how, but uh, he's more honorable. I guess it's because the idea he wants to marry her. Verse 20, and, and Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city and spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it. For indeed, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the uh, gate of his city heeded Hamar and Shechem, his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. So uh, <laughs> the discussion here, obviously, is the, the need to be circumcised. So there's a, <clears throat> there's a lot of justification for this that has to go along. Uh, it's not just what he says, it's what he doesn't say. He kind of for forgets to mention that little thing about the rape going on, and that's what brought all this about. He kind of forgets to, to mention it. Forgets to mention they're still holding her at Shechem's uh, house at this point. Uh, they forget to mention that they've entered into an agreement with them, uh, swearing them on behalf of the city, as the, of the leader of the city, of his people, that uh, if we do this, uh, the marriage takes place and we all become one. Uh, and he for, certainly forgets to, to mention the fact, and I promise them a dowry of uh, uh, any amount that they should, uh, should mention. Uh, and so he, he kind of forgets to mention all that and uh, just gets right to the issue of uh, what they need to do. Uh, in order to persuade them, we'd say the discussion included a motivation, that is, we can gain all their wealth. Verse 23, will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? How's that going to happen? Uh, I guess they're going to cheat, cheat them out of it eventually. Uh, was there a lot? Yeah, Jacob was wealthy. Remember, he was 10 times Laban changed his wages, but whatever he changed, God still blessed him. I mean, when he approaches Esau, he sends ahead 550 animals to give away. It was a little gift. He was prosperous. He was wealthy. These guys said, seen that, observed that. Uh, this kind of uh, going to be kind of rough here for a couple of days, but uh, guys, but in the end, it's going to be worth it because we're going to have all this wealth. And uh, these guys decide to go along with it, which leads us to verse 25. The evil deed was done. Uh, <clears throat> now it came to pass on the third day when they were in pain that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon uh, and, and Levi, or Levi, 
uh, Dina's brothers each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. And they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, uh, with the edge of the sword and took Dina, there she is, from Shechem's house and went out. That's bad enough. It goes on. Uh, the sons of Jacob, the other, came upon the slain, plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took the sheep, their oxen, their donkeys, what was in the city, what was in the field, all their wealth. That would have been bad enough. Then it goes on. All their little ones, their kids, their wives, they took captive. They plundered even that was in the houses. Uh, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious. Uh, one translation says a stench among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the parasites. And since I'm few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? So the evil deed, again, was the murder of all of the men in the city. Again, these are Dinah's or Dina's two oldest uh, big brothers uh, doing this. And, uh, and again, the Bible doesn't spare us uh, any of the, the details. Uh, and of course, they wait until uh, the guys, the third day is the most painful when they're completely uh, uh, incapacitated. It would be very, it's just a slaughter as they, uh, they go into uh, to do this. They kill Hamor and Shechem. They get Dina, they get her out of the house, but they don't stop there. They kill all the other men of the city. It doesn't stop there. The deed included the other brothers because they show up and they take not only the flocks and the herds and everything in the fields, everything in their homes, they take their kids and their wives as well. I bet that was a happy group going down the road together uh, later. Uh, but, uh, you know, this doesn't, in, in a sense, go, go away. Uh, years later, as uh, Jacob is on his deathbed, or just prior to his death, he calls all of his sons together in Genesis 49, uh, and he prophesies over each of them. And uh, pretty much everything he prophesied came, came true. It's uh, it's uh, very interesting, uh, some of the things he said, even the promise of the Messiah when he would come and so forth. We'll look at it more when we get there. <clears throat> but in verse 5, it says of these two, uh, these two guys, Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty uh, in their dwelling. It's like, here, here we go. Dad's last words. What has he got to say? Oh, Dad, what do you got to say to us? Well, you guys are instruments of cruelty. Uh, and he says, let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly, for in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it's cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in, in Israel. Now, interesting that, uh, again, as we, the good thing is not the end of the story. And, uh, and there, there is some repenting going on with these guys later. It's going to get worse before it gets better, though I have to tell you that. Uh, the third thing about the evil deed is the uh, obvious it now is Jacob's concern. It endangers the entire uh, family. And uh, as he says, you know, we've become obnoxious. You know, there were other tribes around. There were many tribes, uh, you know, within the Canaanites. And the idea is that, well, they might be related. They might have had a treaty. They might somehow, and now, you know, big brother's coming after us. You know, it's not enough if you beat the one kid up on the playground that was picking on you. If he's got a big brother, you're still in trouble. Uh, and he says, we're few in number. We're outnumbered. And I don't know how we're going to, uh, to survive. Uh, the thing about his reaction, we would say, is that it was pathetic. Uh, there is no condemnation of the massacre. Uh, there is no condemnation for them breaking the law of an eye and eye, a tooth for a tooth. He doesn't uh, mention the fact that they, they broke their contract and their word with Shechem. They said, if you do this, we're going to do this. Uh, they stood there before God and man and everything else, and uh, they broke their word. And the way they did it would by desecrating the symbol of their faith. And there's not a word or a concern about Dina. By the way, how is she? There's nothing from Jacob. He's concerned about his own skin. I'm pretty sure because you did this, we're all going to die. Thanks a lot. No, what's the, their, big, their big response is, well, our justification should have he treated our sister like a harlot. The answer is no. Does that mean you kill all of them, steal all their stuff? No, not, not at all. And at that point, Jacob is silent. 
Now, when we get to chapter 35, amazingly, God speaks to Jacob again and says, pretty sure this would be a good time to go to Bethel once you rise up and get going. And by the way, even though you don't deserve it, I'm going to put a fear of all these people groups over you. Nobody will touch you. Nobody will harm you. God says, your sin is not going to keep me from keeping my promise. It's, it's amazing. All I've got to say for Jacob is a good thing I'm not God. That's all I've got to say right here. This is like, you're going to get it, man. Are you kidding me? It's just amazing studying these guys week in and week out. And, and of course, they're nothing like us because once we made a commitment to the Lord and we rested with God and we we're trusting God, you know, we're just like steady Eddie, never a problem, uh, never falter. But, uh, but we might know other, there's other people in other churches, of course, unlike ourselves, uh, who maybe can relate to Jacob here. Uh, but it's amazing. What a mess. Uh, the whole thing comes down to, uh, to Jacob. His faith peaked at Peniel. He triumphed in his weakness, reconciled to his brother, comes a deception, comes a compromise, goes where he shouldn't be, and that leads to all of this and all of these problems. And uh, we would say Jacob's only hope is the same as ours, and that is the, the grace of God. Charles Wesley wrote this in uh, 1740, a hymn entitled Depth of Mercy. There for me the Savior stands, shows his wounds and spreads his hands. God is love, I know I feel Jesus weeps and loves me still. I have long withstood his grace, long provoked him to his face. Would not hearken to his calls, grieved him by a thousand falls. Now incline me to repent, let me know my sins lament now my foul revolt deplore weep believe and sin no more pretty good hymn pretty good prayer as well and uh i'm just so glad the story doesn't end here and what we keep saying is not that these guys now they're okay after this they, they continue i mean these these sons of jacob and there's still we got a couple more chapters of some pretty tough plowing to go through in terms of watching what they do and the things that occur in their lives. Uh, but in the end, there's, there gets to be a wonderful scene as they're kind of uh, very humbled in front of the guy that is the prime minister of the most powerful nation of the world. And he's asking about other brothers. And they're saying, man, this is all coming back on us. I knew we shouldn't have done this. And, they're, and he's hearing Joseph is hearing their repentance. And it's only then, and only then, can this reconciliation take place. It's only then, at the end, when they still don't trust him, that he says in Genesis 50, 20, what you meant for evil, God meant for good, and the saving of many. Uh, it's an incredible story. And again, it's my prayer that every time the Bible says, and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, that's the way Jesus uses that term many times in his ministry to refer to God. We just go, that's not the God of the law. That's the God of grace, incredible grace, grace that we can't. Man, it's just hard to get our mind around it. We have an enemy that would say the opposite, that would say, you don't deserve it. You can't have it. It's too late. You've done too much. You've fallen too many times. Why would God even? Why should he? That's why, again, Isaiah the prophet says in Isaiah 55, 9, <clears throat> God says, my ways are not your ways. My ways are higher. They're above. And those ways, again, we said, were about his love, his grace, and his mercy. And we need to remember what God says to us, not what the enemy says to us at times. There's birds flying out there, but they, we don't have to allow them to nest in our head. And, uh, and certainly when God gives us some very specific things that we should be doing, we should be doing them so that we don't incur terrible things for our us and, and those around us. But even if we have, even if we do, there's still the, the rest of the story where God says, well, arise and let's go. And, uh, and that's what he calls us to do each and every day. Love reaches the heavens your faithfulness to the skies, your righteousness.
Judgment and the Mickey will teach his ways. All the taxes. 